Now, Hashem, Hashem, Nasev, and Atzliach, Shul Torah, good to be in Aventura, Bo Hashem. Uh, we've had a couple of really successful shulim here, Bo Hashem, uh, and uh, this is the uh, last uh, shiur before uh, for the year. But uh, Hashem, I'm hoping that maybe tomorrow we'll do some uh, Facebook Live questions and answers. But bli uh, nedel. But um, tonight, as far as lectures with. Uh, students and everybody, uh, this is the last one for the year because I don't think next week is going to work out. But uh, tonight's lecture uh, will add, um, we'll add some new things that I don't think we've talked about in the past. Uh, I think it's going to be a little bit of a different lecture than we've done before. Uh, but still, again, the Pekeavo series, I believe this is number 63, um, <clears throat> connected to the Mishnah as usual. Connected to Chazal, connected to the Torah, Parashat Shavua, it's all connected. How? It's Hashem. It's Hashem's business how it's connected. That's the difference between the New, the, uh, new Testament that's worthless and uh, our Torah that's priceless. You understand? Uh, so uh, before we start with the questions, and in the Shur, we'll do Refua Shlema. Also, uh, um, this uh, shiur will be to Ilui uh, Nishmat Nesriya Bat Sara, and uh, this, um, I'm forgetting another person, but uh, Hashem knows who I mean. And Refua uh, Shlema to Michael Koto, Ampar Belufe, Ruven Joseph Ben Rivka, Sara Lea Bat Sara, Gladys Nunez, Edil Maguero, Josefina Matos, Rachel and Monty Sandler. Duardes Rensoli, Yoshua Michael Ben Hadassa, Nancy Devesa, uh, Patricia Valmana, Michelle Valmana, Sonia Suarez, Nicole Valmana, Augustin Hernandez, Jorge Hernandez, Isabel Bet Betancourt, Liliana Antebonia, Gilberto Meneses, Jacqueline Rojas, Roger Prado, uh, Yedaya Garcia, Pablo Lorenzo, Miriam Batsara, um, Rabbi Elon Ben uh, Annette Miriam, Jocelyn Morejon, Ada Vesquez, Enid Vesquez, Suncha Vesquez, Cantor Bob Resnick, Sarah Gutierrez, Diego Hernandez, Lilian Hariz, um, Dalia Romero, Lindsay Meesters, uh, David Ben Nesria, Doris Barjoa, uh, Rabbi Fahim uh, Ben uh, Shulamit, uh, Levana Batsara and all of Am Israel, Dvora Bat Mercedes, Yuda Ben Dvora, and Elui Neshmat, Amram Ben David, and Benjamin Ben Daya. And you have another one? Oh, sorry. Baruch Hu will raise their Neshamot will, uh, the, of the ones that have passed. And we'll heal the neshamot of the ones that are still with us here today. Amen. So, uh, as I said, uh, today we'll do a few things that we haven't before. Uh, at least not on a full lecture about it. But uh, as usual, we have to connect to your questions. I think you guys have good questions. You have special siyat bishmaya with your questions. It looks like this uh, Facebook Live is uh, going crazy again with the uh, camera going sideways again. Is it going? Did you, can you look on your phones? Um, I think this camera is, Mama Satan himself is uh, going on Facebook Live. Okay, so uh, give me some questions. Oh, we already know the whole Torah? Yeah, another question. Okay, so you're waiting for me to finish the show or you want to do me now? I heard today the Shiur about the Shabtai Tzvi. Shabtai Tzvi, Okay. And how he got so many Jews to fail. Ken. Ken. All right, sideways, sideways. Facebook Live was working uh, perfectly fine for a few months, and today, uh, the last couple of days, it's been shovav. Uh, shovav. Okay, Shabtai Tzvi, Machshimo, what's the question? So he, he got so many Jews to fail, and then go to Islam. And question. So could we now say to this generation, another type of... Do we have another Shabtai Tzvi? No, another type of test that we could fail to the person? We're failing every single day. What do you mean? No, like another false messiah is going to come now. And Many. Convince us Many. What could happen to him? Many. That could happen. It's going to happen. Oh. 
It's going to happen. It's one of the prophecies of the end of times. There's going to be many false prophets. So, uh, and one of them we're going to talk about today. Uh, okay, so false prophets. False prophets. End of times. Times. Okay, next. Ken. Jesus. Ken, Jesus. We're talking about Jesus. Who's who's Jesus, Bechlal? Okay. Okay, so Jesus. Oh, well, that's actually what's a lot of the material that I have today is about this Jesus, which they now started calling him in recent uh, years. They started calling him Yeshua. For many years, for 2,000 years, the Jews called him Yeshu. Imach Shimo Vezichro. Uh, because that was the acronym for Yud is Imach, uh, Shin was uh, Shemo, and Vav was Vezichro. Uh, may his name be blotted out of history. Uh, but uh, we talked about it in the, when we first started the series, the fifth lecture of the series, we talked about him and who he was, and uh, there was recently a pig made a lecture about us, uh, yeah, this uh, camera is going crazy again, but I'm not going to fix it. So everybody else has to change their phones. I'm not changing the phone. Um, and uh, the little piggy made a lecture about me recently, made a movie about me. And his name is not even uh, someone I'm going to mention. Um, so uh, we're going to respond. We're going to respond to the little piggy that wrote a book about pig and, uh, and made a lecture about me, made a movie about me and uh, saying that what I said was wrong. Yeah, I know, I know. I'm not, I can't fix it. I'm not going to play with it for the next two hours. It's, uh, Satan is going to continue coming. If I do it again, it'll probably blow up the whole phone or something. You know, it's just, it's a, uh, it's not, uh, there's nothing I can do. Um, because I have to shut it off and then turn it on every time we lose people. So it's just a, uh, people are just going to have to turn their phones around. Uh, no, it's easier than, than, than me playing with it and losing train of thought and uh, 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 whatever, whatever it's going to be is going to be. So we're going to, this world is upside down. So what, what uh, Chazal says is the world's upside down. And the camera now is upside down. So, uh, okay, so Shabtai Tzvi, Jesus, who else, what else? Okay, how about this? I'll give you guys a picture over here. A picture over here. Maybe I'll give you guys some questions. Is that blood? No, it's not blood. I don't think so. I don't think it's blood. But it uh, looks interesting, though, no? Very strange, very weird, this. Why would a Jew show people a swastika? I'm a Jew. You, are you with me today? You okay? Give him water, give him water, do me a favor, give him water, he's okay, he's okay. Confused, it confuses this picture, right? Confused me when I saw it. Shocking, shocking picture. People at home, I know it's sideways, but you can still see it. No, no, it's not a tattoo, but it's confusing, it's shocking, that a Jew is advertising this right now. Right? So... No, you have any more questions? Or you want to get started? Uh, 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 this is in India. Yesterday, uh, we were talking in, uh, uh, about the, uh, what uh, Shlomo says and what uh, uh, King David said about it. Rashid Hotma. Okay. Hashem. Hashem. One says. The beginning of wisdom is, is fear of Hashem. Yes and no. Yes and no. It's beginning beginning of wisdom is, is fear of Hashem. But uh, knowledge, knowledge. Right. Well, the other one was saying the uh, humility is the. Uh, um, the other one we're talking about is humility is what leads to uh, what leads to um, uh, yirat to, to, to wisdom. Right. So it's two different things. In essence, um, wisdom is the beginning of. Uh, I'm sorry. Uh, 
Okay, the beginning of wisdom is fear of Hashem. Okay, so the beginning of wisdom is fear of Hashem. So before you get to fear, before you get to wisdom, you have to fear Hashem. Okay. And before, before you get to wisdom, you have to fear Hashem. And before you fear Hashem, you have to have humility. humility. So it's humility, fear Hashem, wisdom. That's the uh, map. That's the map that we have. Uh, knowledge. Also, what, where, where is, where, where wisdom is with knowledge. Is wisdom, wisdom follows knowledge. Okay. Wisdom follows knowledge. Because knowledge, Hashem uh, uh, told us to, uh, to Shlomo Melech uh, in uh, Proverbs, actually. He says that uh, knowledge is a gift from Hashem Yitbarach. Uh, as a matter of fact, in the beginning of every Gemara, in uh, the Schuttenstein Gemara, you say a little blessing. And uh, one of it is, uh, is actually knowledge, about knowledge. He uses the... Uh, and uh, hey. uh, so in um, this is Proverbs 2 6 it says uh, because Hashem grants wisdom from his mouth come knowledge and understanding so in order for us to get to ultimate knowledge we have to have we have to have help from Hashem how do we get a hope from Hashem? First, we have to humble ourselves to fear Him. Once we fear Him, we have a connection with Him. Um, the, the problem today is that a lot of people think they're connected to God, but in reality, they're connected to something that looks more like this. And that's what we're going to answer today. What is this shocking, insane picture on somebody's head? It is a kid. Young boy. Go ahead, and then we'll start. Okay. This generation seems to respect us as being, having, like, um, being arrogant. Ken. Okay. So, how can you teach someone, or someone on their own can learn to be humble when everything around you is actually the opposite? Promoting Everything, it's Alma de Shika. So the sages called this world Alma de Shika, meaning the world of lies. What does it mean, world of lies? Does it mean that everybody's a liar? No. What it means is that everything is the opposite of what, in essence, it's supposed to be. When your Yetzirah takes over, it's, uh, in essence, convincing people to want everything that they're not allowed to have. So uh, we chase all the things that are the opposite of what's good for us. So instead of us chasing the um, potion to life, we chase poison. Instead of us chasing spiritual success, we chase material success, and so on and so forth. So there are two options for a person um, to reach humility. Two options. One, learn Torah. Learn Torah, and you will, in essence, reach humility as a result of learning Torah. But learn Torah, not just learning the uh, stories and reading it like a, a novel. Uh, learn Torah, I don't mean just learn alachot, the laws, and just become a robot. When I say learn Torah, another synonym for the Torah that the Gemara uses in Masechet Shabbat is Musar. Learn Musar. Learn the Torah, the type of Torah that's going to influence your character traits. It's going to influence your behavior. Uh, so that's the first option of becoming humble. The other option is Hashem will force you to become humble. That's the other option. One option is you learn how to be humble. Two is Hashem is going to humble you. How does Hashem humble people? Makes them sick, takes away their, the money that they think is theirs, gives them problems. So at the end of times, everyone is going to be given an opportunity to do tshuva. And in order to do tshuva, part of tshuva, the biggest part of tshuva is initially admitting that you're wrong. Initially admitting that your life was wrong. Everything you did until this point is wrong. Shlomo HaMelech, Allah Shalom, says in Proverbs, Ivelet Adam tesalef darko ve'al Adonai yiz'af libo. It says, the foolishness of man will lead him to sin. 
and he'll have the chutzpah, he'll still have the audacity to get angry at who? At Hashem for punishing him. So what does he mean here? He says, the foolishness of man gives him the nerve to go against the hand that feeds him. Go against God. God gave you parnasa. What are you doing? You're going to spend money on Abu Dazara. You're going to go gamble. You're going to go for prostitutes. You're going to go for drugs. You're going to do, use the money for things that are against God. And then when God punishes you, what do you do? Instead of saying, I'm sorry, Hashem, I'm sorry, I'm sorry, I'm sorry. What do they do? They get mad at God. Oh, how come he took my money? How come he took my wife? How come I got sick? How come this? How come? We get angry at him. He says that's how confused a man is before he actually learns to lie and does serious tshuva. He makes his foolishness leads him to sin. And then when Hashem tries to smack him back into reality, he gets angry at Hashem for trying to save him. Because in essence, if you're getting smacked in this world, that means you're still, he's still giving you a chance. It's actually an act of mercy. When Hashem is punishing you in this world, it's an act of mercy. Why? Because he's giving you an opportunity to see that it's his hand that's hitting you. If he wanted to purely punish you, he doesn't need this world for that. He has a special place called Gehenom. Meant for that. Now a lot of people think that Gehenom is some type of Christian invention. Or some type of, uh, it's not in the Torah. So first and foremost you should know uh, Rabbi Yudab Taya. Alava Shalom writes in his book. He says this is a, even a confusion in his age, in his generation. People thought that Gehenom was some, didn't really exist. Well, first and foremost, you should know that Gehenom is actually a combination of two words. Two words. There used to be a place where there was a lot of harlotry, a lot of prostitution, which is against Hashem. Uh, Gehenom. It was two words. And uh, in the Torah, it mentions it multiple places. Where's my Tanakh? Oh, my Tanakh. Okay, my Tanakh. It, uh, so it says, it's a, uh, this was a place that was such an enemy of Hashem Barach that they actually used, they combined these two words and to uh, actually describe hell. This is the place that gives you a VIP to hell. Why? Because even Bil'am Arasha, even Bil'am, the wicked, knew that the one thing that Hashem can't stand is immodesty. He can't stand harlotry, he can't stand prostitution, he can't stand sexual crimes. Um, and we don't just mean sexual crimes like a uh, um, molestation and rape. We also mean sexual crimes when a man is with a woman that's not his wife. Uh, a man is with his wife and she's nida, a Jew is with his wife and she's nida, and things of that nature. Um, so... In uh, the book of Isaiah, chapter 30, uh, chapter 30, 30, verse 33. It's the last verse in the uh, chapter. It says, Ki aruch me'etmol, תפתה גם هي למלך רוחן אימי כי רחיב מדורתה אש ועצים הרבה נשמת אדוני כנחל גפרית בועה רבה so um, so it says for uh, for hell has been prepared from yesterday it has been ready even for the king God has deepened and widened it its inferno has much fire and wood and the breath of Hashem is like a stream of sulfur burning within it. But if you notice, it doesn't say Genom. But here in the English translation, it says hell. How could it be? And the Rashid Chochmah, 
the book Rashid Chokma is the source that Rabbi Yudah Ptai uses, but we have Rashid Chokma also, and they both use the Gemara, and they say that Genom actually has multiple names in the Torah. There's at least seven names for the uh, for Genom in the Torah. Uh, for example, one of them is Talmavet. Talmavet. Another one is Genom. Um, another one Sheol. Uh, so is another one that's a uh, easily missed. In uh, the book of Psalms, it says, uh, book of Psalms, it says, V'atai Elohim t'oridem lebe'er shachat anshe damim u'mirma lo yechetsu yemem v'ani eftach bach. And you, O God, you will lower them into the well of destruction, meaning into Gehenom. Men of bloodshed and, and deceit shall not live out half their days, but as for me, I will trust in you. It's Psalm 55, verse 24. So here we see in uh, Gemara Masechet Sanhedrin, page 106b, talks about this is where Doeg and Achitofel went. They went to this Gehenom, talking about them. But another person that went there and is going to stay there is a person by the name of Jesus. It's a person by the name of Yeshua, or as the Am Yisrael calls him, Yeshu. Now, today, there's a lot of confusion. There's a lot of confusion about who Yeshua was. Who Yeshu was. They call him different names. Yeshua, Yeshu, Jesus, J.C. Penny, Yoshke. All types of uh, names. And uh, you should know in the Gemara, Masechet uh, Abodah Zara, Page 46. That 46. It says, Talmud Lomar, Shaketz te shaktsenu ve ta'ev ta'avenu. Ki cherem u. The Torah is stating here, You shall surely loathe it. This is a verse in the Torah. You shall surely loathe it. You shall surely abhor it. For it is banned. Which shows that the, the name must be derogatory. So here it's talking about, When you're describing Abu Dazara, the Torah, in the book of Deuteronomy, uh, chapter 12, it actually commands you to make fun of it. It's a mitzvah from the Torah, one of the 613 mitzvot, is to make fun of Abu Dazara. It's a mitzvah. So every time you say J.C. Penny, Yoshke, Rasha, all those different things, you're, making, you're fulfilling a mitzvah. What's the verse? The verse is here. It's in chapter 12, uh, verse 3. Verse 3. V'nitatztem et mizbechotam, v'shibartem et matzevotam, v'ashrehem tisrefun ba'esh, v'psilei Eloheim tegadeun, v'ibadetem et shemam min ha'makom ahu. Lo ta'asun ken la'adonai Eloheim. And Shem is talking about idol worship, and he says, "You shall break apart their altars, you shall you shall smash their pillars and their sacred trees, the Asher trees. You shall burn in the fire these Asher trees." Interestingly enough, Christianity has a tree in their house every year. Their carved images you shall cut down. And last but not least, specific to this mitzvah of uh, making fun of idol worship, and you shall obliterate their names from that place. Meaning, obliterate their names, Chazal explains here, in Gemara Masechet Avodah this means make fun of it. Make fun of Avodah Zarah. And then in the next verse, verse 4, says you shall not do the same to Hashem your God. Clearly distinguishing between the two, what you're allowed to do, what you're not allowed to do. In today's age, we are so politically correct, or what I like to say, politically poisoned, correctly, that we are constantly trying to befriend idol worshippers. You now not only have orthodox rabbis starting 
Judeo-Christian organizations. Orthodox. We're not talking about, we're going to get to the missionaries. We're going to get to the messianics. We're going to get to all the other kufrim. We're talking about Orthodox, so-called religious Jews, running Judeo-Christian um, centers, institutions, multi-million dollar organizations, befriending Christians, and in essence, enabling the Christians to missionize in Israel, in America, in Europe, everywhere around the world, freely, without even defending ourselves. Not only are we not defending ourselves, we're opening the door to them, for them. Because any time we mention this name Jesus, we don't want to belittle it, we don't want to make fun of it, we don't want to fulfill a mitzvah from the Torah of making fun of idol worship. We want to be politically correct. No, come on, we live in America, they're hosting us, like they're doing us a favor. The reality is, is as nice as it is to live in America, the Americans don't run America. God does. Just like he runs the rest of the world. He created the world for Am Yisrael and for all those that are going to follow him. Definitely not the idol worshippers. So on one hand, Hashem is allowing the Christians to continue their behavior. But at the same token, he, he, you know, he's not happy with it. The King Kuzari, we talked about last night, from almost 900 years ago, 800 years ago, wanted to praise God every day. But he was doing it the wrong way. So Hashem saw that he has good intentions, so he sent him a malach, he sent him an angel in his dream. He says, Hashem appreciates your intentions, but not your actions. You appreciate your intentions, but not your actions. Now, if you notice, I have more books than usual. Today, one of them, this is many notebooks, handwritten notebooks here. This is all against proving, this is all proving Christianity is garbage. But the Christians themselves could be wonderful people. Could be wonderful people. I would love to help all of them. I would love to convert all of them to Judaism or at least make them Noahites. That's the goal. It's not to insult them. Let's not confuse. But we're trying to help people. The problem is that sometimes help hurts. It requires a reality check. And the reality check is you have the right intentions. The right intentions. But your wrong address. So the Kuzari king invited a Christian New Testament expert. Thank you. A New Testament expert of his time. The New Testament experts of that time were much better than the New Testament experts of today. The closer you are to the source, the more you're going to know. So he says to this New Testament expert, the Kuzari king, which was also a very, very wise man, he says, logic plays no part in your argument. Meaning you, your, your whole New Testament argument, you're trying to prove that God comes, is connected to Christianity, this New Testament, your J.C. Penny is God, or he's a part of God, or he's God's uh, son, or he's a Mashiach, or whatever you're saying here. You're saying this, there's no two Christians that are the same. There's no two Christians that believe the same thing. Every Christian I've ever met has a different belief. But they all use the same book, one of the 200,000 different, uh, 200, different versions of it. But nonetheless, they all claim to use the same book. The most popular version is the King James Version. But in essence, they all arrive at a different belief. They all believe in Jesus to some extent, but in a different way. Some believe he's a Mashiach, some believe he's God, some believe he's a rabbi, some believe he's a sage, some believe he's uh, whatever. Different things. So, the Kuzari king says to the Christian, the expert, the best Christian in the world at the time, the Gdoladol of the Christians, the Avdil, 
He says, logic plays no part in your argument. If anything, logic dictates the exact opposite of your argument. This is the Kuzari King, chapter 1, uh, argue, uh, section 5.2 in the Kuzari. Very, very good book, a debate about the truth. Whether it's Judaism, Islam, Christianity, this king wanted the truth. We want the truth also. In Judaism, you're obligated to search for the truth. But now, since we've been playing defense for so many years, we've gotten to the point where we forgot what offense is. Many rabbis are afraid to mention anything negative about Christianity, anything negative about the New Testament. Not all, of course. There's still great rabbis like Rabbi Mizrahi, Rabbi Tobias Singer, Rabbi Skobak, Rabbi Zitron, and several others that I'm forgetting that actively fight missionaries and the New Testament's falsehood. Uh, but nonetheless, the grand, the, the majority of, of rabbis either avoid the argument altogether or when they mention it, they mention it in a uh, very politically correct way. Uh, just to not offend people because they're scared, maybe they're going to do this, maybe they're going to do that. Well, they still think that we're in the days of the Spanish Inquisition. So what happens is, is that not only does this lead other rabbis to befriend the Christians, but to befriend them to such an extent that we're opening the door to our land, we're opening the door to our neighborhoods, we're opening the door to our keilot, like we saw nine months ago, and we're inviting them to speak at our synagogues. Thinking it's innocent, it's friendship, it's this, little do we know, akol kol Yaakov, the voice is the voice of Yaakov, but the hands are the hands of Esav. He's coming, sounds like he's talking nice things, friendship, maybe even some Torah verses. In reality, the hands are the hands of Esav. He's trying to missionize. He's trying to get phone numbers, addresses, emails. Why? Mission. His mission is to recruit Jews. The Christians, you can already see, from their New Testament, from the book of Matthew, the entire mission of that book, the entire mission of Christianity is to recruit Jews, not to recruit everyone else. If everyone else comes, come. 500,000 black people want to come? Come. 500,000 Arab people want to come? Come. Chinese? Come. One Jew worth all of them together. Why? That's what he wrote. One Jew is worth all of them. Why? For them, one Jew authenticates their belief, their falsehood. You ever notice all homosexuals believe everyone else is also homosexuals, but in the closet. All, there's no exception. All homosexuals believe that everyone has a little bit of homosexual in them. You're just hiding it. You're just not comfortable with it. I know this from experience because when I was younger, you see other kids, you go to these gross places like these clubs and so on, but you don't think they're gross, you think they're fun. So you befriend all these strange people. Some are straight, some are, you don't even know, some are in the between, some of this, some of that. The one common denominator about all homosexuals I've ever met in my life, they could be very nice people, but they all think everyone else is homosexual. The same thing with drug addicts. Drug addicts always want everyone else to do a little drugs with them. They can't stand it if they're smoking or injecting or doing something and you're just sitting there doing nothing. Can't stand it. Why? It makes them feel uncomfortable. Anytime someone is doing something wrong, he wants to bring people with him. You ever hear the, the, the term misery likes company? Trouble likes company too. Sins like company too. Why? Because... It authenticates what they're doing. It gives them a sense of justice. It gives them a sense of righteousness. Because, yeah, I'm not the only one doing it. They know it's wrong. Deep down inside, they know it's wrong. But now you can't just point at them and say, hey, look, he's, 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 the, he's, he's the sinner. No, no, it's us now. It's us. So what's happening today is that the Jewish world is so defensive that we've become defenseless. 
Statistically, I heard recently Rav Zitton say that we've already lost nearly 300,000 Jews to Christianity in just the recent years. 300,000 Jews have converted to Christianity or some form of it. Don't mistake, Messianic Judaism is Christianity, 100%. They can wear talit, they can wear kippah, they can say brachot, they can wear tefillin, they can even call themselves Jews. It's 100% Christianity. Christianity is not based on talit, tzitzit, or, uh, or, or anything else. Christianity is based on which book do you follow? Torah or New Testament? If the New Testament is part of the equation, you are Christian, Catholic, or some form of New Testament believer. If you don't believe, if you believe in a Torah, you're either Noahide or a Jew. As a Jew, you could only believe in a Torah. There's nothing else. En od milvado. There's no partners. There's no other books. There's no additions. Nothing. So now, we've gotten to the point where we're so scared to say this. Because this is what our sages said. It's all over everything I'm telling you is in the Gemara. Everything I'm telling you is in the Torah. It's not my opinion. My opinion is worthless. Which we're, we're going to show you the proofs. That we've lost hundreds of thousands of our brothers and sisters just in the recent past. We've lost millions, millions of Jews since the Holocaust to intermarriage. Millions of Jews. As a matter of fact, the most successful unfortunately the most successful missionaries in the world the most successful leaders of Christian Christianity in the world whichever form of it it is whether it's Catholicism or it's a uh, you know the Christian Church or it's the uh, Ju uh, Messianic Judaism whatever they call themselves it could be uh, you know uh, um, uh, Pokemon for all I care the biggest most successful leaders advocating missionizing other Jews advocating the New Testament are Jews Jews not Christians not natural born Christians and this is what they're proud of as leaders they say listen I'm a Jew but I believe in JC Penny but I believe in Yoshke but I believe in Jesus and so on and so forth this to them, they'll write checks for hundreds of millions of dollars for such a leader. Even if he's a complete moron, imbecile, they'll write him checks, just name the price. Why? It's like having Jesus here today for them. Rabbi Yonatan Ibishitz, Allah Shalom, used to fight against Christianity. And in those days, you couldn't speak freely like I'm speaking now. In those days, you spoke freely, they could kill you. But he didn't care. He cared for the truth. There's a reason why the Torah is called, Hashem Barach calls the Torah, Sefer Milchamot, the book of wars. What book of wars? Some say, just say, yeah, there, was, there used to be a book where they wrote all the wars that we had since the beginning of time. But the predominant opinion is, no, no, no. He's calling the Torah the book of wars. What war? The war for the truth. When you're fighting for the truth, it doesn't matter what the enemy has. It doesn't matter if he has weapons. It doesn't matter if he's bigger. It doesn't matter if he's smaller, if he has rockets. if he has. It doesn't make a difference. You're fighting for the truth. That means you're willing to die for the truth. So Rabbi Yonatan Ibishitz would have different meetings with these Christians. And uh, they would, one time they uh, had a meeting one-on-one, -on -one, long table like this. And the Christian says to him, tell me, what's the difference between a Jew and a dog? So Rabbi Yonatan Ibishitz was very sharp. On the spot he says, table. The table. And he says, you know, if the Jews didn't have the Christians, we'd have peace, no problems. What they do? A lot of them killed us. Not all of them were tzaddikim. Many were ashaim. Some are nice people. Again, this is not an insult on the Christians per se. This is an insult on who they follow and what they follow because it's a mistake and that's what we're going to try to uncover today. And this is not even in essence uh, uh, an attempt to be politically correct. I care less about political correctness. This is because I really care about people. 
I'd like to save as many of them as possible. I've tried, Baruch Hashem, I've succeeded helping many of them get out of this garbage that they call a religion. Now, Rabbi Yonatan Ibishit says, you know, if the Jews didn't have the Christians, if Christians were never around, the New Testament was never around, we'd have more peace. But if the Christians didn't have the Jews, they wouldn't have God. Because the Jew is their God. They made a Jew their God. So all this political correctness is leading us astray. We're losing people. And today they're a lot more sophisticated than they were in the past. In the past, it was such a bad thing that uh, if we didn't, you know, they tried to convert us, and if we didn't want to convert, they just kill us. And idolatry is one of the three sins, three cardinal sins, where you're not allowed to worship idols under any condition. Better off you die and not worship an idol. So many people died on Kiddush Hashem. Some people failed, unfortunately, and today we still have people that are called Anusim. Their ancestors were forced to convert, but they're trying to come back. The, the descendants are trying to come back to Judaism, and they all have to go through uh, a, uh, a conversion, a Safek conversion. Um, but anyway, the point is, is that today, there's no killing. Today, they're not trying to kill the body like the Romans did. Today, they're trying to kill the soul. How? By fooling us into Christianity, by saying, calling Christianity Judaism. But Judaism that believes in Christianity too. Some call it Jews for, uh, Jews for Jesus, some call themselves Messianic Jews, and so on and so forth. But all of this is just hogwash. All of this is like a, uh, you know, it's putting seasoning on poop. It's not going to change. Now, this is no different than a lot of the other things that we're, we're, we are confused by. One of them is this picture that I've showed you a few times, which I'm sure you're all very interested in what this picture is. Now this picture is a little boy in India, and he has a swastika on his head. All Jews know what a swastika is, because we lost six million of our brothers and sisters for the sake of this symbol, the Nazi symbol. But what most Jews don't know is the swastika is actually part of Hinduism. It's the part of the Indian system. It's part of the Indian religion. And a very key part that came before Nazi Germany, the swastika has already been around for generations. Some actually trace it back all the way to Amalek. All the way back to Amalek, biblical times. Now where is this, where we see this? This is on a tonsured head. This is a boy that just sacrificed his hair in one of his temples. And his hair is going to become a wig, possibly on a Jewish woman's head. So when this report came out recently, this report came out recently saying that it's impossible to know that any wig is excluded from idolatry because the vast majority of human hair wigs are coming from these Indian temples. People didn't like this report. They even said bad things about me as if, uh, you know, I, uh, I created it. I made it up. I forged it. I did this and that. There's a lot more information I didn't give you. There's a lot more information that's not in the report. There's a lot more stuff that's much more disgusting. But people just don't want to listen. Remember I told you the Vilna Gaon Allah Shalom, he says to his, his wife, and he get it agra, he says, if the kids curse, hit them. Why hit them? He says, sometimes a Jew, you tell him something, you tell him a verse from the Torah, he listens, he does tshuva. But sometimes his heart is heart of stone. And the only way you can get water out of a stone is breaking it. And that's why he told you to hit them. Because if they already got to a point where they're cursing, that means their heart is a heart of stone. A kid's supposed to be pure. A kid's supposed to be a pure neshama. If he's already cursing as a kid, we have a problem. You have to hit him. Get him back to where he's supposed to be. So I gave the information about the wigs already over a year ago. No one wants to listen. A few listen here and there. Now you have more information. A few listen here and there. Now you have more information. A few listen more and there. Now tell me, what Jew 
on planet Earth doesn't know what a swastika is. What Jew on planet Earth wants to have this as part of their lifestyle? Every single way coming from India, whether you believe it's part of idolatry or not, irrelevant. Every single person that goes to the temples and shaves their head is putting this symbol on their head right after. It's part of the process. Amalek has infiltrated inside your home. Amalek that Hashem commanded us to destroy is on some Jewish people's head right now. Ashkenazi and some Sephardics. You want this on your head? Enjoy. Ivelet Adam Tesalef Darko Ve'al Adonai is Aflibo. The foolishness of man will lead him to sin and then he'll get upset at why Hashem didn't give him Parnasa, didn't give him Zivug, didn't give him Refuash Lema, didn't give him the prayers answered of all the prayers that he has. We're always mad at Hashem. Don't you realize you have Abu Dazara on your head. Abu Dazara is everywhere. It didn't go away. So this had to be mentioned. This is a chidush from the Rabbanit. Now. Yeah. Yeah, I track that symbol too. And if you look at the old statues of Buddha, Buddha, that was... They have it also. Yes, yes. Meditation. Yes, yes. Buddha has it. So it's, it, it tracks back all the way to Amalek. And one the, 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 is that the, like in Russia, and Ukraine, is that they were communists. Not even allowed to be Christians. Uh-huh. Is that like better off what they did or what the communist Christians? is atheism? Is that also like idol worshiping, not to believe in God? Believe in yourself. Somebody has to be God. Mm. Somebody has to be God. So now you have yourself a problem. You have idol worship sometimes in an Orthodox Jewish home, and you have idol worship outside the home. Either way, you have to deal with it. Now the one we're going to deal with mostly today is the idol worship of Jesus, Christianity. Now in this lecture that I mentioned, it was the lecture of Yeshua ben Pachia. Yeshua ben Pachia was, according to the Gemara Masechet Sota, page 47. Uh, according to Gemara Masechet Sanhedrin, page 107. According to Gemara Masechet Gitin, page 56 talks about a person by the name of Yeshu. And I said, it's known that Yeshu was, Jesus was the student of Yeshua ben Palchia, one of the sages, one of the early sages that lived nearly 200 years before Chorban Bet HaMikdash. So this pig that made a lecture about me, he actually happens to be a Jew unfortunately, and he happens to be a Jew that is now called Amin. What's Amin? Amin is a person that actively recruits Jews away from God. He recruits them to Christianity, but he calls it Messianic Judaism. And he calls Jesus Mori Rabbi, his teacher and his rabbi. Apparently he doesn't know the definition of teacher and rabbi. And he fools people to their face, despite the fact that his speaking skills are ones of an autistic child, despite the fact that his intellect are the equivalent of a dog's, he's fooling people. How? He speaks Hebrew. That's how he's fooling people. By speaking Hebrew, someone that doesn't speak Hebrew automatically thinks you're Moshe Rabbeinu. Someone that doesn't speak Hebrew Hears you speak Hebrew, he must be Moshe or a descendant of Moshe. Maybe he's Jesus himself reincarnated. Just speaking the language gives you credit. You agree with what they said in this other language? Oh, 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 oh. where do I? Who do I make the check payable to? Doesn't matter whether you make sense or not. It makes no difference. Let's not let the facts get in the way of the truth. So now, he speaks in Hebrew, he speaks in broken English. He's also married to a non-Jew, has a couple of kids, and he's leading this congregation. He calls this 
place that he has. Uh, he started a yeshiva. What yeshiva? And he made a movie and he says to me, or about me, that uh, I made a mistake that shows my ignorance. That it's known, it's commonly known, that Yeshu, Imach Shimo Vezichro, that was the student of Yeshua ben Parchia, is not the same Yeshua that Christianity believes in. And the fact that I said it is shows how ignorant I am. And he says, look, there's people that say it's not. So, Baruch Hashem, the first thing we're going to do is we're going to confirm once and for all who Jesus was according to the Torah. Enough with playing around. Once and for all, is he the one mentioned in the Gemara or not? <coughs> they don't want it to be the one that's in the Gemara. Why? Because the one that's in the Gemara is a Rasha. He gets killed. He's called a Rasha. In the Gemara Masechet Gitin, it says this Yeshu is, came in a, uh, to a seance that Onkelos, Onkelos the convert, was supposed to be the next Roman emperor, but he converted to Judaism instead. Onkelos the convert is in every single Tanakh, every single Sefer Torah, Chumash that you buy, there's Targum Onkelos next to it. All of Judaism, all of everything depends on the commentary of Onkelos the Gale. That's how important he is in Judaism. And many other minagim like kissing the mezuzah. Now, the key is that this onkelos, before he converted, Gemara says he did a seance. He didn't, you know, he didn't know he's not allowed. He did a seance. And he brought three neshamot. First, he brought his uncle, Titus, the former Roman emperor. He says, Titus, should I convert to Judaism? In English, Titus. Titus says, no, no, it's too hard for you. You are from Roman lineage. We're used to people serving us. Just kill a bunch of Jews and God's going to at least reward you in this world. Go against the Jews. And he says, he asks, so Onkelos says, where are you? He says, I'm in Geno. What are they doing to you? He says, every day. They burn me up and they take the ashes and spread them all over the oceans. All seven oceans, they spread my ashes because I thought maybe I could hide from God. So God is giving it back to me, measure for measure. He's spreading my ashes, then they put me back together and burn me again. They put me back together and put me again. And again and again for eternity. Why? Why? Onkelos asks his uncle, why are they doing this to you? He says, because I went and I desecrated the Bet Mikdash. That's a great better than that. Okay. Next he brings Bilam. Bilam was the prophet of the Goim. Bilam Arasha. There's a pasuk in uh, Parashat Balak. Parashat Balak that I thought about when I saw this movie by this guy that uh, he talks about me. And uh, it's a very interesting pasuk. When he started talking, I thought of the pasuk that says... And God opened the mouth of the donkey. The donkey spoke to Bilam. So when the guy talked, I said, Oh, Hashem opened the mouth of the donkey. He's talking. So this donkey was talking. Bilam was a Rasha Merusha. And his wife was the donkey. He would commit relations with this donkey. And he went against the Jews. He led... Many Jews to die because of how he fooled them by convincing Balak to send all of his women there and lead the Jews to sin. And from there we learn that it's bigger to cause somebody else to sin than to sin ourselves. But anyway, Onkelos, the righteous girl, before he converted, brings Balak. He says, should I convert? He says, no, you're not going to make it. Judaism is too hard. You come from royal lineage. Just kill a bunch of Jews and at least God will reward you in this world because he needs people to use his tools to wake up his people. He needs a staff. Hashem 
Sometimes uses Irma. Sometimes uses the Roman Empire. Sometimes uses earthquakes. Sometimes uses the Nazis. Sometimes he uses the church. Sometimes he uses the Messianic Jew. Different things. So now, he says, where are you? He says, I'm in Genom. What does your genome look like? He says, I am boiling. They're boiling me in semen. In semen. Why semen? Because I wasted all the seed on the aton, on my wife, the donkey. I committed one of the worst sins in Judaism. In the Torah, I made relations with an animal. So all this seed, I'm boiling in it. Until when? Forever. Then he brings who? He brings Yoshke, he brings Jesus. Uncle is the Gare brings Jesus. He asks Jesus, should I convert? Jesus says yes. Kamara says, Jesus says yes. Because why say yes? Because they're the, they're the real leaders of the world. Hashem created the world for them. In this world that you live in, unfortunately they're persecuted, they're beat up, they're, they're going to a tikkun, they're going to a trial. But in the real world, they're the leaders. They're the chosen people. And he says, where are you? He says, I'm in Tzohar I am in boiling feces. He goes, why? Why are you in boiling feces? You just told me to convert. Seems like a righteous guy. He goes, because I went against the rabbis. What were the rabbis? What was the word for rabbis that he went against? Now, who knows? Who read the New Testament here? What word did, did Jesus use for rabbis his entire life? The Pharisees. Pharisees. Who are the Pharisees? Chazal. Who are the Pharisees? What do you think? It's just Pharisees, just a bunch of guys <laughs> running, uh, running delis? Who do you think the Pharisees was? Chazal, the sages, the giants of the generation. Already here you see there's a match. Why? In the Gemara, Masechet Gitin, the guy that's boiling in feces in Genom forever, says, why am I in Genom? Because I went against the sages. You read the New Testament, whether it's Matthew, John, Luke, Jehennam, whatever you want, wherever you read it. Who did he go against his entire career? The Pharisees. The same thing it says in the Gemara. His whole life he was going against these rabbis. Why? He said, they're wicked and he's, he's righteous. How? We're not really sure. Why? Because he says, I'm here to comply with the Torah. But if you look at what he says, it's not exactly complying with the Torah. One simple example. He says to his students in the uh, book of Matthew, he says to his students, go get me that donkey. Go get me that donkey, and if it's tied to the tree, untie it and bring it to me. That's called stealing. Thou shalt not steal. Obviously, if it's tied, if it's just a donkey roaming in the middle of nowhere, F kill doesn't belong to anybody. But if it's tied to a tree, that means the owner is nearby. So they tell him, well, maybe the owner is nearby. They know, obviously, they're, they're, even the students weren't as stupid as him. They say, maybe the owner. He goes, no, no. If somebody tells you something, tell them it's for me. Like it's a mafia. Tell them it's for me. Forget about it. Forget about it. It's for me. Then you have another place. Jesus, this, you know, they rebuke him and say, why are you violating Shabbat? I'm above Shabbat. Above Shabbat? You're above Shabbat? You know that Shabbat is another name for God? Did you guys know that? Shabbat is another name for God. You're above God? You're above the covenant? You're above the number one treasure of Hashem Barach? You're above Shabbat? How come you don't keep it? You said in another place in your New Testament that you're not here to change the law. Not even a yud. Not even a letter. You're changing Shabbat. I had a debate with a uh, Catholic missionary in my dentist office I told you guys about. What was the end of the debate? I told him, yeah, you say you follow the Torah, right? He says, yeah, of course we follow the Torah. I said, what day is Shabbat? He goes, no, we changed it. Changed it. If God gave Shabbat as part of the Ten Commandments, who are you to change it? You human nothing. 
Where did they learn it from? They were learning it from this false leader. And there's many, many other places which we're going to go over of how he's a completely full of lies. Yeah. No. No. The ones that wrote the book, first of all, we actually don't know who wrote the book. Because it's not like the book of Matthew ends with love Matthew. It was actually written anonymously. Each one was written anonymous, anonymously anywhere between 70 to 300 years after he died. So there's different opinions of who wrote the book, who wrote which one, the books, each one contradicts the other. There's a lineage in one book of 25 people connecting Joseph to King David, but another book is a completely different list for the same person. So there's multiple arguments. One argument says, no, 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 it's a, uh, because they're trying in essence to connect Jesus to King David to prove he's the Mashiach, Mashiach. But you have a problem. You just said that Jesus is the son of God. He's not related to Joseph. What, what, what do I care if Joseph is uh, connected to, to David or not? He's not his father. You said that Mary got pregnant by God. Shem So there's a lot of contradictions in the books. So now, continuing. You already see that the Gemara of the worst punishment matches the New Testament. Why? It says, Jesus himself says, I am in Geinom, forever, in Tzorah in, in poop, that's boiling, lava of poop, forever. Why? I went against the rabbis. You look at his book, regardless of who wrote it, everyone follows it. There's 200,000 versions of it. All agree he went against the rabbis. Already you have something, it sounds kind of the same. Already sounds kind of the same. Now, you have yourself a, another thing. You have this Mishnah, this week's Mishnah. This week's Mishnah says, Rabbi Yossi Omer, Kol HaMechabed et HaTorah, Gufo Mechubad, Al HaBriyot. Ve Kol HaMechalel et HaTorah, Gufo Mechulal Al HaBriyot. Bezrat Hashem will connect this Mishnah to Yoshke. And how we show proving that it's all falsehood. This Mishnah 4 8, continuation from 4 7. We did 4 7 yesterday. Obviously, it's Yat Bishma, it's not planned. You see here it says, Rabbi Yossi says, whoever honors the Torah is himself honored by people. Whoever disgraces the Torah is himself disgraced by people. So Rabbi Yossi. Simple translation here is that whoever honors the Torah, whoever honors the rabbis, whoever honors the Tamidei Chachamim, whoever honors Hashem, Hashem will lead people to love Him. The world around Him will love Him. Why? You're showing, a le- you're showing Hashem love. You're showing His firstborn son's love. The world around you will show you love. On the other hand, you show Hashem hate, you show his children hate, you desecrate his children, you desecrate his Torah, the world around you will hate you. This is, by definition, the beginning and the end of Jesus. By definition. What did he do? He went against the Tamidi Chachamim. He went against Chazal. The sages, what ended up happening? The world around them hated him. They crucified him, they killed him, they abused him. And even till this day, he's insulted on a regular basis by his own people. So that's first thing. Second thing is, how is this connected? It all depends, we learn who is Rabbi Yossi. Rabbi Yossi himself is a proof of this other thing. Rabbi Yossi... Bar Khalafta lived in Usha. He used to process hides. Aside from being a sage, Tamid Chacham, he used to process hides. And he lived at the time of Rabbi Akiva, and he was the student of Rabbi Akiva, right at the time where the Roman Empire, Imach Shimam Vizikram, 
had the emperor Hadrian, Adrianus, or Hadrian in English, Adrianus in Hebrew. And this is when they killed Rabbi Akiva. They shaved his skin off. And instead of complaining to God, what did he do? Kriyat Shema. Shema Yisrael, Hashem Elokeinu, Hashem Echad. And his neshama left his body on Echad. Sanctifying Hashem's name until the last moment of his life. When he was getting butchered up by these Rishayim, his students said to him, Rabbeinu, you could say the Shem HaMephorash, you could say the name of Hashem, you kill everybody here. Why are you letting this happen? He was 120 years old. Why are you dealing with so much pain? He says, my whole life, I've been trying to fulfill the mitzvah that I say every day in Kriyat Shema. Ve'avta et Hashem Elokechem. Bechol levechem, kol nafshechem, kol meodechem. Kol levechem, my whole heart, I gave. My money, I gave. My life, I never gave. And I was worried my whole life, I'm never going to be able to give my life for Hashem. Now I finally have a chance after 120 years and you want to ruin it for me? Till the last moment of his life, this tzaddik yesod olam that got to the 50th level, the highest level of kedusha, highest level of kedusha, sanctifies Hashem's name. Le'avdil, J.C. Penny, what does he do when they crucified him? Complains to God. Why'd you leave me? Wait a minute, didn't you guys just say he's God? What, he leave himself? He left himself? What, he leave himself in the bathroom? What happened? Why'd you leave me? How are you complaining about yourself? And if you're not yourself, if you're a Mashiach, how dare you complain about God? Well, you don't know that there's something called Kaparat Avanot. You don't know there's such a thing that Hashem, everything is for the good? What happened? So here, Rabbi Yossi lived at this time. Why is this important? When Rabbi Yossi lived, that he was the student of Rabbi Akiva, that he was living at the time of Hadrian. Why? Why is this so important? Because Rabbi Yossi was the author, according to Rabbi Yochanan, in Masechet Yevamot, page 82, of a book called Seder Olam. Seder Olam. Seder Olam has two parts. Seder Olam Rabba, Seder Olam Zuta. In Seder Olam Zuta, Rabbi Yossi, look at the Siyat Dishmai here. Rabbi Yossi says, the, Yo the Yeshu mentioned in the Gemara, that's the student of Yeshua ben Parchia, is the Yeshu Anotzri. Is the Yeshu, the Rasha Merusha, that God, Am Yisrael, to leave God. Same one. Same one. Who? Rabbi Yossi. It's almost like you would think I planned this guy making a video about me. Hmm. Now maybe you think, maybe this is only one opinion. Because what the Christian church says, Christian church says, no, I can't be the student of Yeshua ben Parchia, like this Chazir said. It can't be the student of uh, Rabbi Yeshua ben Parchia. Why? He says Rabbi Yeshua ben Parchia lived almost 200 years before historical records say that Jesus lived. Because Jesus lived at the time of Adrian. Here's the problem. Rabbi Yossi lived at the time of Adrian. So you're going to tell him who he saw, who he didn't see? He actually lived there. If Yeshua, Jesus, whatever you want to call him, Shu, Call him whatever you want, Gargamel. If he lived, he would have known, hey, this guy walked on water. Hey, this guy, I don't know, caught some fish. This guy uh, sold candy. This guy got whatever. You would have known, hey, Yeshu, Manishma, how are you? What's going on? You tell him, hey, what's up? High five. Something. You should do tshuva. Something. He says, I was alive. I wrote a book. In the book, it's historical records. Historical records of what happened at the time of Adrian. Yeshu, nowhere to be found. Nowhere to be found. There are only two places that talk about Yeshu. New Testament, like I said, 70 to 300 years after he died. And Gemara. No newspaper wrote about him. No journal. No little baby that wrote a report. You know, they ask little kids in school. 
Who is your idol? Abba is my idol. The baseball player is my idol. The, uh, I don't know, Smurfs are my idols. No one said, no one wrote a little school report. Jesus that walked on water, according to their uh, nonsense, he's my idol. No one said it. No one wrote anything. Now you have, you live in Florida. There's, I don't know, there's sports. There's uh, different camps and so on. If a little baseball team, little league team, seven, eight, nine, ten-year-old kids, they play a game, there's some newspaper that will write about this game. In the grand scheme of the world, this game is not really important. No one really cares about the game other than the parents, really. But some newspaper will make a big deal enough of this game and will write it in a newspaper. And if the game is a championship game between two towns or two cities or two countries, they may even go on the national news, even though it's a game for 10-year-old kids. Right? Somebody will write about it. Somebody will write a journal about it, a newspaper article about it, something. So you would think, if the Mashiach arrived, or God in human form arrived, someone would write about it. Even Shabtai Tzvi they wrote about. They wrote about. Someone would write about it at the time. Something. A journal, uh, a letter, a uh, love you note, a uh, news, something, a show, I don't know, a reality show or something. Here's a reality show. A woman named Mary cheats on her husband but fakes it. Says that God made her pregnant instead. I don't know, something. Something. Something would happen. Nothing. Why? Only record is in the Gemara. So you would talk, okay, so the Gemara talks about it. He tells you who he is. No, they don't want you to. No, 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 it's not him. It's not him. What do you mean it's not him? They lived at that time. That's the only record. No, no, they, there's other sages that say it's someone else. So let's see what the sages actually say. Now, the story goes as, as follows. At the time of King Yanai, he killed many, many Chachamim. And Shimon ben Shatach's sister was actually King Yanai's wife, and she sent a letter to say that things have calmed down. Yeshua ben Parachia, who was uh, Jesus' rabbi, fled to Alexandria of Egypt with his students. But after things calmed down, Shimon ben Shatach sent him a letter and told uh, Yeshua ben Parachia that things have calmed down, you can come back. So on the way, he stopped at a achsanya. Achsanya is like a hostel, like a cheap hotel. And he says, he was hosted very nicely, respected. And he says to the student sitting next to him, Jesus, what a nice balabite. Such nice people to hosting us with kavod. It's very nice. Jesus says, he thinks, he thought that Yeshua ben Pachya, Kodesh Kodeshim, Holy of Holies, is talking about how good she looks. Instead of saying, oh, it's nice that they're hosting us nicely, meaning it's, it's etiquette, manners, you have to have it, especially if you're Ben Torah. This Sote, Yeshua over here, thinks that he's actually talking about how good she looks or how bad she looks. So what does he say? No, what are you talking about? She's ugly, she has round eyes, meaning like she looks like a sheep. Who is he saying this to? To his rabbi. His rabbi says, Rasha, wicked, this is what you do, this is what you occupy your time with, looking at women, this is what you've learned from me, and he kicks him out. He kicks him out, Jesus tries to come back, first two times he comes back, first two times he comes back, Yeshua ben Pahachia rejects him, to see that it's authentic tshuva, the third time he comes back, Yeshua ben Parachia was planning to accept him, but he was in the middle of Kriyat Shema. And as you know, Allah says, you're not allowed to stop Kriyat Shema. Not allowed. Even if there's a snake climbing your leg, you're not allowed to stop Kriyat Shema and start talking to people. Snake goes around your leg, you're not allowed to, not allowed to stop, you have to continue Kriyat Shema. 
So of course, if a tembel over here wants to say a uh, you know something, you're not going to stop Kriyatshma. So what does he do? He tells him like this with his hand, like wait a second, without saying anything. Wait, Jesus was too egotistical to wait. He thought that he's rejecting him again, and he says, "Okay, I'm going dafka against the chachamim. I'm going against the Pharisees." He called them Pharisees. Chazal. He called the the, the sages Pharisees. I'm going to go against them. What is he going to do? He's going to start. Getting people to follow him. And he started doing it. He started using sorcery and different magic to get people to follow him. Became a Baba. Now Yeshua ben Pachya thought about it. He says, you know what? He's still a Jew. Let me go save him. He humbled himself even more and he went to Jesus. He says, Chazor Becha, do tshuva, come back. In Gemara Masechet Sota, it says, page 47 says, I learned, Jesus says to Yeshua ben Pachya, he says, I learned from you that once somebody becomes a machtia rabim, once you lead people astray, you become, you lead other people to go against God, you have no more tshuva. And he left. He didn't want to do tshuva. It's not really true. Meaning, what the actual lesson is, what the Torah says, not that there's no tshuva, is that you, once you become machtia rabim, once you become a min that uh, gets other people to go against God, you don't get help from heaven to do tshuva. You can always do tshuva, but you don't get the siyat vishmaya that a regular sinner would make just once he wants to do, do tshuva. Tshuva is always accepted. It's just a matter of, you're not going to get the extra help from Hashem, which means it's going to become, become much more difficult to do tshuva. But Yeshua, Yeshu, Jesus, whatever you want to call him, he didn't listen to the rest of the shiur. He just listened to the first part. So he left. So now, these messianics don't want you to believe this is the same Yeshu. So already we have this Mishnah, Rabbi Yosei, Ben Bar Chalafta, verifies the same Yeshu. Same one. Let's continue. In Tfusim uh, Yashanim, on Sanhedrin 103a, uh, gives commentary on Psalm 90, verse 10. And they say, may your son never be like the son, uh, may you never have a son or a Talmud that spoils his own cooking, Magdiach Tavshilo, in public, like Yeshua Nutsri. says, so uh, this commentary on this pasuk is that may, you know, the, make sure you always pray that you never have a son or a talmid that ruins everything, that gets other people to sin, like Yeshu the Nutsri. It says it in a uh, brachot also. It says, may we never have a student that spoils his own work, like Yeshu the Nutsri. Brachot 17b. So here we're talking about this Yeshu. Is this Yeshu the same one? Rabbi Yehuda Levi, the same Rabbi Yehuda Levi that we talked about, that wrote the Kuzari, that had the debate with the Muslim guy, with the Christian guy, won the debate. He writes in Ma'amar, Number three, Siman 65. In the Kuzari, it says, Yeshua ben Pa'achya, his student was Yeshu. It's the same Yeshu that started Christianity. This is 900 years ago. Already you have source number two. Much closer than anyone in recent history that says otherwise. Continue. Rabbeinu Yaakov ben Rabbi Meir Tam, Rabbeinu Tam, his son, his son, Rabbeinu Yaakov, he says in Tosfot on Masichet Shabbat, page 104b, Yeshu was the Yeshua ben Parchel's student. The Yeshu that started Christianity. This is, again, almost 900 years ago. Rabbi Yitzchak ben Yosef, a Israeli, in uh, Yesod Olam, it says the founder the foundation of Christianity 
started in, in the days of Yeshua ben Parachia due to his student, Yeshu. Again, Rabbi Yitzhak Abarbanel, Rabbi Yitzhak Abarbanel, one of the greatest minds that ever lived, but he was also very familiar with Christianity. How was he familiar with Christianity? What was his job? He was the treasurer of the king of Spain. When? During the Spanish Inquisition. When they killed us and kicked us out for being Jews. After we won the debate. They didn't like it. So it loses indeed. In a commentary on the book of Daniel, he wrote a book called Mayane Yeshua, Mayan 10, Tamar 8. He says the following, Many are trying to fool the people by saying that Yeshu, that's in the Talmud, who was the student of Yeshua ben Parachia, is not the same Yeshu from Christ Christianity. How could those fools of today, who were not there at the time, tell our sages who saw with their own eyes what happened? Now he's saying this while he has the Spanish people trying to kill us. He doesn't care. Ishemet. Why? If there was ever a time to lie, this would be the time. Save yourself. No save, no nothing. This is the truth. Don't sugarcoat the truth. Don't be politically correct. They want to kill us, die. Don't make it like the Talmud is different than what it is. Why? It's Chilu Hashem. Rabbi Aaron Milunil. Rabbi Aaron Milunil, in a letter printed in Sefer HaChachamim, Mekorot Ayamim, Oxford, 5448. He says the following, I did an in, uh, intensive investigation and calculation of the Christian calendar and whether it began with the birth of that person, meaning Yeshu. And I confirmed it's a big mistake. The Christian calendar is a mistake. They claim that their calendar started with his birth or death. There's no connection whatsoever. Yeshu was in the days of Yeshua ben Parachia. And I confirm this with Christian scholars. The Christian scholars of his day says, yeah, yeah, you're right. This calendar that they have is wrong because Yeshua, their Yeshua, their Jesus, lived almost 200 years before, 150 years before. Their calendar, the Christian calendar, has no root or foundation. Rav Yom Tov, Lifmin in Sefer Anitzachon, Siman 332. It says, Yeshu that was the Notsri was Yeshua, uh, Yeshua ben Parachia's student. And what the Christians are saying about him being born at the time of Holdus, meaning Hadrian, is completely false. It was well over 100 years later, meaning 150 years later, same exact time frame. As we said, Rabbi Yossi confirmed it in Seder Olam, which is nearly 2,000 years ago, at the time. So we have not just proofs from 500 years ago, 800 years ago, 900 years ago. We have proofs from 2,000 years ago. At the time, this is supposed to be happening. People that I witnessed it. In Seder HaChachamim, Mekorot Ayamim, Oxford, 648, pi, uh, part 1, page 196, it says, Yeshu died well over a hundred years before the destruction of the Bet HaMikdash, 
And he was the, soul, the same student of Yeshua ben Parachia that's mentioned in the Gemara. The Ravad in Sefer Kabbalah says the historians write that Yeshu was the student of Yeshua ben Parachia in the days of King Yanai, which was over 110 years earlier than the Christians say that he was born. But the truth is in our hands. The truth is in our hands as the Mishnah has not changed. And there's many, many, many others that say the same. There are a few that say otherwise. But the predominant opinion, overwhelming majority of the opinion of the sages, the same issue same thing same thing now the ones that have a different opinion also have a different shita of who he was at all there's about a handful of different opinions of who he was Tosfot Arosh writes that the issue is different than the ones that are mentioned in Sota and in Sanhedrin but both were Eshaim that used sorcery and led other Jews to become uh, to, to sin, both for minim. Rabbi Yehuda Hasid also agrees, says that there was two different Yeshus mentioned in the Gemara, but both were Reshaim. Doesn't help them. Whether it's this one or it's that one, they're both wicked. They're both in Gainum forever. It makes no difference. But then there's the one that they're probably going to try to hold on to. The debate, the famous debate by Rabbi Yechiel Mi Paris. Rabbi Yechiel Mi Paris had a famous debate with a heretic called Nicolas Donin. This is written in Notzar Vikuchim, page 84. And Rabbi Yechiel Mi Paris did everything possible to prove that the Yeshu that's mentioned in the Gemara is not the same Yeshu at all. The Yeshu of Christianity is not even mentioned in Judaism. Not mentioned in Judaism at all. Why? Why is it not mentioning at all? Because if you look at the history and what happened, at the time, Nicholas Donin was trying to pass a decree to kill all the Jews for killing their God, for killing their Mashiach. So to save the entire people, we have to use our brain. We have to use our, how are we going to say it? Well, we, can't, we can't run away in time. We can't fight them. What are we going to do? Rabbi Yechel Paris says, I'll tell him it's not the same guy. What are you going to tell me? Otherwise, it's our Torah. You're going to tell me who it is? I can decide who it is. They don't know how to read Hebrew. They don't know anything. So he's not arguing that it's not the same guy because it's not the same guy. He's arguing because he's trying to save our life. He's trying to save millions of people. It's Pikuach Nefesh. It's changed the whole thing. If you Shabbat is on hold for Pikuach Nefesh. So here you see that the overwhelming majority of the sources indeed prove this Yeshu Yimach Shimo Bezicho is indeed the same one. There's no mistake about it. Yes? Yeah, I heard that, uh, that the testament that J.C. when he was hungry for stuff and up food. Ken, 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 we'll get to that, we'll get to that, we'll get to that. We'll get to that. We'll get to that. We'll get to that, we'll get to that, we'll get to that. thank you. So now, you see from here that this guy, same guy. Same guy. There is another opinion. Another opinion didn't exist at all. An opinion didn't exist at all because there's no record of him other than the Gemara and if they're saying it's not the same guy, then he didn't exist. There's no record of him existing. That's another opinion. Another opinion is actually that he's called Ben Sidita. Ben Sidita. Ben Sidita is a much more interesting story. Why? In Ech Tov Israel by Rav Ephraim, he writes in uh, Perek 
פרק ב', חלק שני, in סימן ו', in the footnotes here, he writes the whole story of Ben Sidita, that this used to be part of the Gemara, but the Christians took away everything. So it's mentioned, Jesus is mentioned in the Gemara, but if you look at the English translation of the Gemara, it's not mentioned. His name is not in there. Arch is not in there. In some Hebrew, he's in there. Some, not all. Why? Because the church put a knife to our uh, neck and said, if you don't remove it, we're going to kill you. So the question is, if it's not the same guy, what do you care? If it's not the same guy that's boiling in a, uh, in a, in a, uh, in feces right now, in a jacuzzi of feces, what do you care if he's in my Gemara? It's not the same guy. What do you care? Why would you sanction us? Why would you put a sword to our neck? Why would you kill us? Why would you chase us? Why would you torture us for some guy that's not the same guy? Why? Because the same name. You know how many people have the name Yaakov? You know how many people have the name Yitzchak? You know how many people have the name Yeshua? There's a lot of people. So just because we use the same name? Why? There is another reason. Another reason is because many believe that this very same one, very same one, is either also Ben Sidita or Ben Sidita is the real one. Either way, it's also not good. Why? Ben Sidita, why is he called Ben Sidita, the Gemara says? Ben Sidita was the son of Miriam Magdalene. In Hebrew, it's called Miriam uh, uh, Magdali, which is the same thing. Who used to be married to one of the Chachamim. By the name of Papus ben Yehuda. Papus ben Yehuda. Now, Papus ben Yehuda was a big Chacham, but he was a jealous husband. So he did not allow Miriam to leave the house. So when he would leave, he would lock her in the house. And Chazal says this was not the right thing to do. You're not allowed to do that. He made a mistake. This led her astray. Meaning, gave her an excuse to want to run out. But what happened? She met a goy boyfriend. We we'll talked to her like the story of Romeo and Juliet. From the window. She says, Miriam, Miriam, when are you going to come down? One day on Yom Kippur, Smoke Ma says, one day on Yom Kippur, Papus leaves to go pray. This boyfriend called Pandira, his name was Pandira, calls Miriam. And he says, Miriam, Miriam, how long are you going to be locked in? Want to come with me? She runs away with them and she gets pregnant. On Yom Kippur, she gets pregnant. Now what happens to a woman in Judaism, a Jewish woman, that not only goes with a goy, but is married? It's called Eshet Ish. Eshet Ish, Chayav Mita. Death penalty. To avoid death penalty, what do they do? They invented a story. God made me pregnant. There's a Jew's border. Only the ignorance border. The point is, that's the story. That's Pendira. So, so, so this Pendi, um, Ben Sideta was named after the mother. After the, the mother that's called a Sota. She was a Sota. Why? Because he was a Mamzer. Mamzer is son of a woman that cheated on her husband. So that's another opinion. And Gemara says that, that Ben Sideta, that's Yeshu. Either way, he could still be also Yeshua ben Parchia's student or not. Either way, all opinions, is not good. You don't have any kids, right? That I don't know. That I don't know. It's possible. Yes, yeah, possible. No, who knows? All I know... You can't have kids, no? No, you can have. Of course, you can have kids physically. But as far as his kids, they have to marry other mamzerim or converts. But uh, uh, it has nothing to do with what we're talking about. just kill her in the bed team after she cheated on her husband? Who just killed her? The, the Jewish people, after she, because she, they know 
And she cheated on the husband. They didn't buy the food. They ran away. Oh, she ran away. Ran away. So now, you have yourself quite a bit of information here that is overwhelming amount of information proving sorry um, proving that yes my friends the negative opinion about Jesus it's in the Gemara is indeed the same Jesus let's not fool ourselves to think otherwise it is indeed the same person Now, what do we do with this information? Now that we know that Jews are not exactly big fans of Jesus. Why are we saying this? Why, to just upset the Christians? What? What purpose did it serve to upset them? We're not trying to upset them. We're actually trying to save them. You see, in Ilchot Shuva, the Rambam writes, there are five individuals that are described as minim, Amin has no share of the world to come. One is one that says that there's no God, no ruler of the world. Two, one that accepts the concept of a ruler but maintains that there are two or more rulers. This, unfortunately, is what happened with Christianity. They have shituf. They have, uh, their God is three. Three. One who accepts that there is one master of the world, but maintains that he has a body or a form. Meaning, humanized God. You have a problem. Four. One who maintains that he was not the sole first being and creator of all existence. Meaning there was some God before God. Five. One who serves a star, constellation, or an entity so that it will serve as an intermediary between him and the eternal Lord. Each of these five individuals is considered a mean. Idolater. An idol worshiper that is actively not only desecrating Hashem's name by his belief, but is looking to recruit others. A mesit, also. Now this mean has a serious problem with God. He thinks he's worshipping him. All the while, he is going against him. This is not nice. Not nice to go against your God. Especially if you're trying to do good. So let's continue. Now that we know who Jesus is, let's see and prove that this same Jesus, let's say you don't want to agree with me, he's not a Rasha, he's not this, he's not that. Let's say you don't want to agree. Let's confirm that regardless of who you think Jesus is, regardless, part B, you still have no reason and no leg to stand on if you believe in the New Testament. Why? Because the New Testament is not from God. The New Testament claims to be a continuation of the Old Testament, a.k.a. Torah. Now, in order for it to be a continuation, that means they must agree with each other. They cannot contradict each other. Now, there's something called a postulate. A postulate means that you are going to have the certain things that everyone agrees on. Everyone agrees on. Whether you're Christian or Jew, you have to agree to this. So, example of a few postulates. Rabbi Tobias Singer is an expert in this field, and he talks about this. This is where I learned this specific part from. And he says, everyone agrees, Christian or Jew, that it's possible, possible, that the New Testament and the Old Testament, Old Testament, meaning the Torah, being the Old Testament, or how we like to call it, the only Testament, and the New Testament, it's possible that they're both right. It's possible. Statistically, it's possible that they're both right. It's also, that's a posture, meaning everyone agrees to that. You have to agree that it's possible. Even if there's a 1% chance, it's possible. Two, everyone agrees, everyone agrees that it's possible that the Torah is right and the New Testament is wrong. 
everyone agrees that it's possible for the Torah to be right and the New Testament to be wrong. It's possible. Why? Torah came first. Before Christianity was born, there was only Judaism or idol worship. There was no other form of Judaism. There wasn't conservative reform, Chabad, uh, a, 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 you know, uh, Breslev. There wasn't any of that stuff. It was Judaism, and then there was idols. Then there was Christianity, and then 80,000 other religions were born after that. Point is, that at that moment, before Christianity was born, everyone agrees, Judaism was definitely right. Before Christianity was born, everyone agrees, Judaism was definitely the right place to be. Why? Because it cannot be that the New Testament that's based, that started Christianity is right while Judaism is wrong. That's the last one. It's not possible for the New Testament to be right and Judaism be wrong. Why? Because you can't be a continuation that's valid while your foundation is wrong. You can't have a happy meal if the foundation that you put all the seasoning on is rotten food. Cannot be. So it, it can be that the Torah is right and the New Testament wrong, but it cannot be otherwise. It cannot be New Testament right and Torah wrong. That is a postulate. That means everyone must agree to it. Whether you like me, don't like me, you like Jews, you hate Jews, it doesn't make a difference. Everyone must agree to this. This is a given. This is common sense. Fine. Now, let's prove that the Torah we already know from previous lectures is divine. How do we know it's divine? There's information in the Torah that is, could not be given by God, could not be given by anyone other than God, such as laws about nature, numbers of stars, different things like that. It's very, very easy to prove the Torah is from God, and even the Christians and the Muslims both agree the Torah is from God. Everyone agrees Torah is from God. Now, the New Testament, on the other hand, cannot be from God. And that's what we're going to try to show a few facts. Not too many, but just a few facts to show. One, if you're a book from God, that means you can't contradict yourself. You cannot be wrong about anything. God is not wrong. God is God. If he's wrong, he's not God. He's human. If he's human, you don't have to keep Shabbat anymore. You don't have to worry about Oshana. You don't have to worry about anything. Why? If he's human, he's just as much of a God as you. You understand? So, now, in Matthew chapter 5, 17, Jesus says, no one is allowed to steer away from the Torah and not even remove one letter, one yud, which is the smallest, physically smallest as far as how you draw it, Letter, one yud from the Torah is not allowed to be removed, and whoever removes this yud is cursed from heaven. Okay, so here he says, you're not allowed to change anything in the Torah. Whatever is written in the Torah, the a.k.a. Old Testament, is eternal, which is what the Torah says about itself. Problem? He later on says, I'm above Shabbat. He later on says, things that are against the Torah throughout the entire New Testament. He contradicts the Torah. As a matter of fact, Christians today keep nothing from the Torah except one law. One law that's actually according to the Torah, since we do not have the Bet HaMikdash, is no longer an obligation. What is it? Give money. It's the only law in the entire Torah, the tithe, the Maser, is the only law that Christianity keeps from the Torah. They give Everything they give, oh, the no, Christians, Christ, the Christians, <laughs> Christians give myself much more than Jews do. Let's not mistake ourselves. Every Christian that attends church, if you don't give myself, they don't even come to church. There was one rabbi that had a meeting with a, I don't know, apparently has a friend that's a, uh, leads a church. And he uh, says that uh, the rabbi was complaining. He wrote an article about this. He's complaining that uh, they're having financial problems. This big Kayla, they're having financial problems. 
and the uh, priest or pastor or whatever he is says to them, yeah, no problem. You'll probably fix it at the end of the month, though. So the rabbi writes, he says, I thought maybe you know something about my own keila. I didn't know. So I asked him, what makes you think that I'll fix this big financial problem, big money problem, by the end of the month? He goes, well, isn't that when you're going to get the ma'asel from your entire keila? And the rabbi says, what do you mean from the entire keila? He says, don't you get ma'asel from everyone in the keila? You have a thousand members. Don't you get ma'asel from everyone? He goes, no, not exactly. So the priest thought, he goes, oh, yeah, you know, us too. We also have like 2% of people don't give, meaning 98% give ma'asel. The rabbi was embarrassed to write, in my keila, only 2% give. Ma'asel. And this is a reality. This is a reality. That's the mitzvah from the satan. Why? They're going to keep ma'asel like robots. Give money, give money, give money, give money, give money. Shabbat, no thank you. Midot, no thank you. Tarat mishpacha, no thank you. Kosher food, no thank you. Modesty, no thank you. Nothing. Everything else. It's not relevant anymore. Jesus said it's not relevant anymore. It's obsolete. He died for it. So here you see contradiction. Continues. There's a lot of material, so let's, let me try to continue. The Torah specifies in Parashat Chaya um, after Sarai Menu. The wife of Avraham Avinu died. Avraham Avinu bought Me'arat HaMachpelah. Who did he buy it from? Who did he buy it? Not where. Who did he buy it from? Ephron. Ephron Achiti. The New Testament says in multiple places that Avraham bought it from the sons of Chamor. Who's Chamor? The one that raped Dina. Didn't even live in the same generation. Different person, Bechlal. On top of it, it's very specific in multiple places in the Torah, in Parashat Chay Sarah, in the book of Joshua, in multiple places, where the Me'arat HaMachpelah is located. Where is it located? Hebron. New Testament says, in Act 7, where is it? Shechem. Different city, Bechlal. Nablis. Different city. Miles and miles away. It's not even the same. You want proof for it? Go to Marat HaMachpelah. It still exists. What, God forgot the address? The Torah says that Yaakov Avinu, in no less than three places, Yaakov Avinu, in no less than three places, it says Yaakov Avinu, came down to Egypt with how many? Seventy souls. New Testament says seventy-five. All of a sudden, their God forgot how to count. Seventy, we just added five. Where did the other five come from? Where did they come from? Last but not least, the Torah specifically says in the five books of Moses in multiple places, book of Deuteronomy in multiple places, but also in the books that the Christians love the most, where they love the most, prophets. What's one of their favorite prophets? It's Isaiah, Jeremiah, Ezekiel, all these prophets. They love prophets. Why? Because they're the most difficult to understand. Now, let's go with the book they like. They like Jeremiah. Jeremiah, chapter 11, verse 2 through 5. It says, Cursed be the man who will not obey the terms of this covenant, specifically mentioning how idol worships, idol worshippers bring trees into their house. It says, Whoever brings trees into their house, it's a form of idol worship. Every year, Christians bring trees into their house. And unfortunately, some Jews too have become Christianized. Last but not least, I mean, I could give you proofs from here until next year. 
there's mamash. I have, I don't know, five, six books full of notes. And there's more at home. But what, I'm trying to give you things that I like the most and some things that perhaps weren't mentioned or you haven't heard before. I'm sure you heard of most of them, but not all of them. In a Torah, there's a word called Re'em. Re'em is a biblical animal that was like a giant ox slash deer. It doesn't exist anymore. It was a giant animal. It's mentioned in the Torah nine times. Nine times in the Tanakh. Psalms 22, verse 21. Psalm 29, verse 6. Psalm 92, verse 10. The book of Job, 39, verse 9 and 10. In Deuteronomy, five books of Moses, 33, chapter 33, verse 17. And book of Numbers, 23, 22. So both in the five books of Moses and beyond. Re'em is a giant animal. The, the Chazal explains a giant animal that is like a bull or an ox slash deer. It's really, really big, says the Midrash says. Yes, Midrash says that uh, one time uh, David Amelech was uh, with his sheep and he thought he was climbing a mountain, but in reality it was this animal. It was this animal. It was a huge, huge animal. It was like a dinosaur. Believe or don't believe, this is what's written in the Torah. It doesn't make a difference to me whether people believe in stuff like this. They think that dinosaurs is like a, you know, had to live 50 million years ago. That's a conversation for a different time. Point is, it's mentioned in the Torah specifically what this animal looked like, who, what, when, and how. Nine times nonetheless. We use the skin of this animal for many things and so on and so forth. In the most famous version out of the 200,000 versions of the New Testament, the most famous version is the King James Version. The King James Version uh, translates the word re'em to what? Unicorn. Unicorn is a cartoonish animal that was made for kids' stories. It's a known thing. It, there is no such thing as a horse with wings. And a horse, and a, and a, it's, it, it's a cartoon. It's like saying Gargamel. It's like seeing Smurfs hung out with uh, Moshe Rabbeinu. This cannot be, like, I mean, anyone that looks at this, this for me, I don't know, maybe, maybe I'm making a big deal out of it. But for me, nine times you got the word wrong, you put a cartoon, you put Bugs Bunny in the Torah, who's going to read the rest of the book? You put Bugs Bunny in the Torah, and you still want to believe this New Testament? It's craziness. But that's the thing. So the proofs against it are endless. 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 We'll give you a couple of things to take home and understand the significance of what we're talking about here. Hopefully the sh the shoe is enough, but Bezat Hashem, books will come soon too. Also, they said in the I don't know if you say in the Torah, in the Psalms, what the what the David says, uh, "You save me from the horn of the lion." And if you that's actually the Psalm. That's the Rem. That's the Rem. Yeah, that's the one where he climbed the Rem. Uh -huh. That's where he climbed the Rem. Yes, Chazak Baruch. Okay, now the. Book of Deuteronomy, chapter 4, verse 27, 28. It says something extraordinary. It says a prophecy of what's going to happen at the end of times. Christian, Jew, somewhere in between, you're going to have to deal with the end of times whether you like it or not. The Torah says what's going to happen at the end of times. This is something I mentioned in my personal story. is one of the most moving verses or you know, the most moving verses in our lives. I saw this in the movie by Rabbi Mizrahi, I love a, 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 a sheikh uh, and uh, this is a extraordinary, extraordinary verse because it has a prophecy of what's going to happen at the end of times after Hashem punishes us and sends us to the four corners of the world as part of the exile. There's good that's going to come out of it too. The Zohar Kadosh says part of the job is going to be to convert the righteous amongst the people. But before we get there, 
את סז והפיץ אדוני אתכם בעמים ונשארתם מתי מספר בגויים אשר ינהג אדוני אתכם שמה ועבדתם שם אלוהים מעשה ידי אדם עץ ואבן אשר לא יראון ולא ישמעון ולא יאכלון ולא יריחון. It says at the end of times Hashem will scatter you amongst the people and you will be left few in number among the nations where Hashem will lead you. There you will serve gods, the handiwork of man, of wood and stone, which do not see and do not hear and do not eat and do not smell. So here in these two verses we see Hashem is going to send us as a punishment to be exiled, we're going to be lost, we're going to be few in numbers, we're not going to be two billion people like the Chinese, we're not going to be two billion people like the Christians, we're not going to be two billion people like the Muslims. We're going to be few in numbers. This we see. You don't need me for that. You already know. But he says there you're going to be idol worshippers. You're going to do a mistake. Okay, we see. Many are lost, fall, fine. No, but he specifies what kind of idol. The idols that are made by men. Okay, we know idols are made by men. No problem. No, 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 no. The idols made by men represented by wood and stone. Two leading religions in the world today. A wooden stone wood being the cross of Christianity stone being the stone in Mecca for Islam this is nice but could be a coincidence if you look at Torah codes you look at Torah codes which is equal equidistant uh, <coughs> skips between letters it's a mathematical way of mathematical way of See, finding secrets in a Torah, you see that you'll find here in this verse the same verse that implies that Christianity and Islam will be born somewhere in the future. Because at the time this is written, there's no Christianity, there's no Islam. This is 1500 years before Christianity was even a thought, this is over 2000 years before Islam was even a belief. This is written 3300 years ago. He says they're going to exist, it's a prophecy. We see here, we find both of them in this verse. Using Torah codes, you will find with an equidistant uh, skip of 49 letters, both the name Mecca, which represents where the Islam stone is, stone of Mecca is, this is where they have their celebration every year, and also Yeshu. Yeshu is in here, in this verse. Now, this I already said in the past. This is not a chidush. What's a chidush? A chidush. It's a beautiful chidush. The Arizal, the Arizal, Allah wa Shalom, all the mystical parts of the Torah that we know from the Zohar that Rabbi Shimon Bar Yochai wrote over 2,500 years ago, or 2,000 years ago, we didn't understand it. The Arizal was studying with angels. He didn't have Chavruta like you and me, a regular person. He studied with angels. He was Mamash, Kodesh Kodeshim. In the time of the Arizal, I'll give you a story about the Arizal. In the time of the Arizal, there was a lot of tzaddikim. One of the tzaddikim was, that was known as like the city's speaker was the Al Sheikh, the Al Sheikh Kadosh. And he would give drashot, he would give uh, divre Torah, give uh, speeches. And all the Chachamim, including the Arizal, would come. All the Chachamim would come. One time he comes, the Arizal comes to the speech of the al Sheikh, and the al Sheikh is talking about the 100 lies that Lavana Rasha made in the deal with Yaakov. Yaakov came to work for him. For what? To get married to Rachel. And he lied to him 100 times. He changed the deal. 100 times. And he named all 100 times as part of this lecture. He named all. How, I mean, lying 100 times is, is my life. You have to be an expert. 100 times. And every time the Al-Sheikh will said something, he saw that the Arizal is laughing. 
the end of the lecture, he comes to the Rizal, and he says, Kodarav, I'm wondering, why were you laughing when I was, each time I mentioned one of the things that the Lavana Rasha was doing to Yaakov, why was, what was so funny? He goes, oh, when you speak, the angels come down here. And sometimes the sages come down here and they listen to you. Divrei Kodesh. Today, not only did they come, they brought Lavana Rasha also. They brought Lavana Rasha to watch your lecture. And every time you mentioned one, he had to admit, yes, I did that. So all of us were laughing because he had to admit, yes, I cheated this, I cheated that one, I cheated this, I cheated this. This is, Arizal sees this on a day-to-day -day basis. Mystical, you want to believe, don't want to believe, it's not my business. It's your problem. That's Arizal. This same Arizal. He had a chidush. And he says, Yeshua Nutsri, the one that started Christianity, the one that came, that was a student of Yeshua ben Parachia. He's the Gilgul of Aesav. He's the Gilgul of Aesav. Reincarnation of Esav. Esav died as Neshama came back as Yeshu. It's not finished. It's not finished. Esav, his father was Gdolado, Yitzchak Avinu. His grandfather is even bigger, Avram Avinu. His twin brother. He's going to be the leader of Am Yisrael, Yaakov Avinu. But you go in the Tanakh, you go in the Tanakh, and you go to Sefer Malachi, the prophet. Christians like prophets. Sefer Malachi, chapter 1, right in the beginning. Ve'o'av et Yaakov ve'et Esav saneti. Chapter 1, verse 2. It says, And I loved Yaakov. Hashem says, And I loved Yaakov. But Esav, I hated him. I hated him. Why? Do you ever hear Hashem saying, I hated Paro? Paro tortured us for years. Do you ever see Hashem say, I hated Paro? No. Do you ever see Hashem write, Nebuchadnezzar destroyed Bet HaMikdash, destroyed my house. Destroy the Beit HaMikdash. You ever see Hashem, right? Nebuchadnezzar, I hated him. No. No. Esav, I hated him. Why? He knew the truth. His father is Gdol Adol. His grandfather is a bigger. His brother is a tzaddik. Every day he says, I'm going to do tshuva. Every day I says, I'm going to do good, I'm going to do good, I'm going to do good. The next day, rasha. No tshuva. Esav saneti. Arizal... The Arizal HaKadosh says, Esav, Gilgul, Yeshu. Now I heard a chidush recently by Rabbi Glazerson, who deals with Torah codes. Chidush of the Chidushim. He says he uses Torah codes. He says you look at Sefer Bereshit, you look at the book of Genesis, you look at the time, the page, the paragraph, everything. When Esav was born, we're not talking about the entire Torah. We're talking about just exactly Mamash when Esav is born. Esav, Yaakov, born. Talks about Esav. It says on that page, you're going to find Esav, but you're also going to find Yeshu. Six times. That's not enough. You're going to find Yeshu and Nutsri. Not enough. Yeshu, Nutsri, Tzlav will be crucified. Not enough. His mother, Miriam. All same page within five, six verses. Not enough. Gilgul. Esav, Gilgul, Yeshu. What do you want? You want him to come out of the Tzohar or Tachar and tell you he's not, he's not good for you? It Esav Saniti. Why are we telling this? 
For what? It's not because we don't like Christians. They're also Hashem's creation. It's quite the opposite. The mean that wrote, made a movie about me, if he doesn't do tshuva, I'm obligated to hate him. It's a mitzvah in the Torah to hate someone that's bringing people away from Hashem. Does tshuva, different status. But for all the others, they're just lost in Christianity and whatever form of it is possible, I'm here to offer you an opportunity that Hashem offered you already 3,300 years ago. At the time that he wrote the Torah, he made rules, both for Am Yisrael and for the Goyim. He says, what made the Jews Jews? What made them Jews? Their mother? Not true. Why? You could convert into Judaism. Meaning your mother, your biological mother, can be Amalek. Doesn't make a difference. You want to convert to Judaism? You can. What do you need to do? Follow the Torah. The Rambam. In Ilchot Isure Be'ah, the 11th Alakha, gives you something that Christianity has been lying to you about. They call anyone that goes to Christianity a born-again Christian. This is hogwash. There's not born-again nothing. You're going to born-again Abu Dazara. As we saw today, there's no doubt about it. The book of New Testament is toilet paper. The leader in the book, worse than toilet paper. You want to go to Hashem? There's an opportunity. What's the opportunity? The real born again. In Ilchot Isure Be'ah, this is the Alachot of Judaism. The Rambam wrote, the 11th Alacha. The Rambam writes, when a non Jew converts to Judaism, he's considered 100% baby. Brand new Neshama. His new birthday is not the day he was born biologically. His birthday or her birthday is now the day she converted. Why? Because that day she receives a new neshama. According to all alachot, according to all opinions, a convert is considered 100% a baby, meaning the day she's converted or he converts, they're considered zero years old. They could be 65 biologically, but according to God, they're zero. Baby, meaning no sins, nothing. You start afresh. You have an opportunity to be brand new. Unless there are, obviously, if there are sins that you can still fix, like for example, if you stole money, you have to return it. But if you had sex crimes, if you had things that you can't fix, you have an opportunity to fix it the real way, God's way, not some uh, crazy way that some guy that's in Gainom said, whether he said it or not. You have an opportunity to be a Jew. You can't be a Jew, it's too late, it's too difficult, no problem. The Rambam also says there's another law. Be a Noahide. And something called Chazde Umot Aulam. These are the righteous amongst the nations. The rest of the world. Hashem said, listen, not everyone needs to be a Jew to get Olam Abba. You could be a righteous Gentile. Or what they call today a Noahide. What you have to do? There are seven main laws, similar to how we have Ten Commandments and everything is based as a root from the Ten Commandments. They have seven main laws. No idol worship, don't eat a living animal, don't worship other gods, have a court system and so on. But from those seven, we also have ethical laws. So it's, there's somewhere around 40 or 50 laws overall. But it's simple. All you got to be is a decent human being because God said it. Not because it makes sense. The Rambam says, they are the wise among the nations. Why? Because they're following God's laws, because God said so. But the Gentiles that follow God's laws for no reason, just because it makes sense, not only are they not the wise among the nations, they're actually the fools among the nations. Why? They're doing all the work without getting paid. So to get Olam Abba, you have two options. One, become a righteous Jew. Or two, become a righteous Gentile. Either way, 
Leave this J.C. Penny behind. Leave this Christianity nonsense behind. It's very, very simple to know that the Torah is real. No one disputes it. It's now very simple to know the New Testament is fake. We've already written about it from eyewitnesses. Eyewitnesses saw it. You can't tell the Jews what to believe. You can't tell them they're wrong, but at the same time say they're right. We have a Mishnah here that even J.C. Penny agrees with. He says, anyone who honors the Torah himself is honored. Not only honored in Shemaim, but honored by the people around him. J.C. didn't see that. Yeshua, Yeshu, whatever you want to call him, Gargamel. He, didn't, he wasn't honored during his life. He wasn't honored during his life. They killed him. They tortured him. They didn't believe in him. They, in his own book, they call him a drunk, someone crazy. He constantly went against his own word. It made no sense. The very same sin that they don't want you to know about is why he's where he is. You see, Yeshua ben Pachia, he threw him out because he looked at women. It's a sin. It's against the Torah to look at women. It can lead you to waste seed. It can lead you to do make sex crimes. It's not good. It's against God. They don't want you to believe that he's the same Yeshua. The funny thing is, is that he contradicts himself in his own book that someone wrote, and we don't even know who. He says, if your eye leads you to sin, pluck it out. Well, Yeshua, it's time for you to pluck out your own eyes. Yeah. Any questions? Yeah, I've been uh, researching a little bit to Buddhism. Yeah. Just this, and I see like hundreds of millions of people follow it. Now, I know it's Islam Canadian. Poor people. and Christianity, you know, that's like almost a thing of billion people also Buddhists. So I know yeah. Christianity and Islam are mentioned in the Torah and Code. Yes, just, we said it's Islam. Just, no, I know, but is Buddhism also mentioned in that Pasuk of Code? In that same Pasuk, not that I know, Actually, but Buddhist I can check. Buddhism started way before Christianity. There's Again, it's years. possible. I, do, I never looked for it. Does it say it? Oh, I, I, I never looked for it. I have to look for it. I haven't, I haven't looked for Buddhism. Buddhism is just a, uh, I don't know, it's, I think it's crazier than the other two. I mean, yeah. you buy the statue from Chinatown for $15 and you start worshipping it. I mean, it doesn't make any sense to me. Yeah, but there's a lot of following. Follow, yeah. follow, following doesn't mean right. Following, yeah, yeah, yeah. you know, it means nothing. Yeah, you know, the, the, the well, numbers the mean absolutely yeah. nothing. Who was the time that was able... When he was hungry, he went to a tree. The tree gave food on the spot, even though it wasn't a season. And JC couldn't even get fruit. There was a town that was able to do that. I, was think, I believe it was Rabbi Yochanan. Rabbi Yochanan, also, there's a story of um, uh, Bar Kapara uh, came, yeah, to, was, came, to, uh, came to the yeshiva of Rabbi Yochanan. And uh, Bar Kapara had a split lip, his lip was broken. But it made him look like he was smiling all the time. And Rabbi Yochanan was very old. And uh, he uh, was given a shield Torah. And Bar Kapara was answering all the questions and asking certain questions where it was like chidushim for Rabbi Yochanan. It was a very big surprise. So Rabbi Yochanan looked at him for the first time. And it looked like Bar Kapara was laughing at him. Because it looks like he was smiling. So from being a, you know, upset momentarily in Shemaim, they killed Bar They killed Bar on the spot. They buried Bar A few days later, the conversation of him uh, comes up, and Rabbi Yochanan says, yeah, what a chutzpan this guy was. Why are you saying he was a chacham? He was no, kvod arav. He wasn't a chutzpan. He, he, he's, uh, he was a good student. He was tamid chacham and so on. He goes, what do you mean? He was laughing in my face. He was no kvod arav. He wasn't laughing. That's how his face is. He has a broken lip. So Rabbi Yochanan says, Oh, you like, you know, my, let's go bring him back. Kvod arav, he died. He died. The Maraz says he went to the cave. He brought it back to life. He says, come back. Come back to life. He came back to life. Anyone that was mentioned in the Gemara by name was able to, and did bring people back from the dead. 
You cannot mention someone by name and them not have the ability to bring back the dead. So what people say about JC, whether he did it or he didn't do it, doesn't make a difference. Even if he did this or even if he did that, bringing back the dead or making miracles or the, with the fish or with the fruit, all that stuff, some of the stuff was even done in recent history. You lo- talk about the life of Baba Sali. Baba Sali, what, 40 years ago? Baba Sali, on the spot, there's eyewitnesses. A guy that was in the army, this is actually in the, uh, what's it called, book that we read recently, of different Sipuret Sadiqin. Baba Sali, there's witnesses, there's not one guy. Not no witnesses and they just wrote a story. Mamash, witnesses, many people. A soldier from the army got injured in the army. Injured, became nechet, became uh, paraplegic. Lost the ability to walk. Came with a wheelchair to the Baba Sali. The Baba Sali says, he wanted a blessing, you know, he was very, very depressed and so on. Baba Sali says, are you willing to keep Shabbat? And he says, yes. On the spot he started walking. In front of everyone. On the spot. On the spot. Not uh, you have to go to uh, exercise. Nothing. On the spot. He told him, get up. He got up. He started walking. <laughs> Baba Sali, 40 years ago. That, did Baba Sali say that he's Mashiach? We're nothing. These miracles mean nothing. Even it says in the Torah. It says in the Torah. Miracles don't mean anything. It doesn't mean you're Mashiach. Doesn't mean you're Mashiach. It means nothing. Not only were the miracles that they say he did not a big deal, not a big deal at all, because many other people did him. Even if he did or he didn't, it doesn't make a difference. It means nothing. This Sipuet Sadiqim stuff that actually there's witnesses of that happened 40 years ago, 50 years ago, 100 years ago, 500 years ago, 2,000 years ago. Moshe Rabbeinu, Moshe Rabbeinu, it says in the Torah, no one will be like Moshe Rabbeinu, ever. No one before, no one after. Hashem writes it. God writes it. No one will be like Moshe Rabbeinu. No one will be like Moshe Rabbeinu. No one will be like Moshe Rabbeinu. Split the sea. Miracles after miracles. Food from Shemaim came, not for one day. Not some fish. Man from Shemaim came every day for 40 years. You didn't have to take a shower. You didn't have to change your shoes. You didn't have to go to the bathroom. 40 years. The biggest civilization in the world, the strongest civilization in the world, went from being the strongest, biggest, wealthiest, to begging their slaves to leave. The the master became the servant. And the servant became the master. First and only time in history that the slaves became masters. They begged them to leave. They gave them money to leave. Hmm. Moshe Rabbeinu is the leader. Spoke to God face to face. Everyone saw this. Millions and millions of witnesses. Does it say Moses is God? Anywhere? Does it say Moses is any? Nothing. What does it say? The opposite. It says Moses, humblest man that ever lived. Moshe anav me'od. Me'od. Me'od means extra. He's the most humble. This is the epitome of the opposite of how they describe J.C. Penny. You understand? He couldn't even get food from a tree. So, so that's the thing. It's, it's just mistake after mistake after mistake in this New Testament. Please, pay attention. Anyone that's searching the truth, Hashem says, I've been waiting for you. I've been waiting for you. And we'll finish it off with this one verse that for me was very, very special because it's very tough for people to restart. What am I going to do now? What's this? What's that? See Hashem in that very same verse. Very same verse that uh, he talks about how he's going to split us and spread us all over the uh, four corners of the world and so on and so forth. He says something extraordinary. The very next verse, he says this. After all this balagan is going to happen. It says, Ubikashte misham et Adonai Elohecha umatzata kitidreshenu bechol levabecha ubechol nafshecha. Adonai 
ושמעת בקולו, כי אל רחום אדוני אלוהיך, לא ירפך ולא ישחיתך ולא ישכח את ברית אבותיך אשר נשבע להם. From there you will seek Hashem your God and you will find him. If you search for him with all of your heart and all of your soul, meaning you search for God, you'll find him. If you didn't find him, that means you haven't searched for him as, you know, as much as you search for money, as much as you search for different things in the world. If you haven't found the truth, that means you haven't searched enough. But Hashem promises you here, all of mankind, you search for him, you're going to find him. Especially at this time. Why? When you are in distress and all these things have befallen you, at the end of days, specifically talking about now, you will return unto Hashem your God and hearken to His voice. For Hashem your God is a merciful God. He will not abandon you nor destroy you. And He will not forget the covenant of your forefathers that He swore to them. You see, here you have Mamash, a promise from Hashem Barach. All you need to do is search for the truth. That's it. Search for the truth. He promises you you'll find it. It's time to leave all this hogwash, other religions, New Testament, False Testament, Other Testament. There's only one testament. It's called Torah. You want to be a Noahide? Shrecha. You want to be a Jew? Let's go. It's time. We're running out of it. Hashem sent us Elul, day of, uh, the month of Tshuva. Rosh Hashanah is in a few days from now. That is judgment day for everyone. How much money are you going to get for the next year? Whether you're going to get married? Whether you're going to live? Whether you're going to die? Whether you're going to have kids? Judgment day for everyone. All of mankind. We didn't do Tshuva over the last month apparently, so He sent us Irma. If Irma is not enough, he's going to send other things. It's better you listen to what I'm saying than Hashem sending you more Irmas, more earthquakes, more missiles, more atomic bombs, more craziness. Why? Once the Mashiach comes, Gemara Masechet Abu Dazara says in page 4, end of 3P, 3B, beginning of 4A, no more tshuva, no more conversions, no more nothing. It's the end. Mashiach arrives, finished. There's no more, oh, I didn't know. Jesus wasn't the Mashiach. I did no more. Finished. Finished. Time to do tshuva. Bezat Hashem, the shiur, will spread all over the world, wake up many souls, Jewish souls and non-Jewish souls, get them back to Hashem Barach as Hashem wants them to be, to come back home, to do tshuva, to sanctify His name, and Bezat Hashem have a lamaba.